You know, the thing that you have a passion for is what you're going to talk about. And, and I think a lot of people want to be better at witnessing and want to be more, let their light shine more. They just feel intimidated. And I always say it like this. My thing is this. Don't share what you do know. Don't feel bad about what you don't know. But let what you don't know motivate you to want to know more, right? So instead of being satisfied on the surface with your relationship with God, want to go deeper. Because I promise you, the Bible tells us no good thing will he withhold from us. If you're chasing after him with your whole heart, he's going to expose a lot to you. Marcus Aurelius said, what we do in life echoes through eternity. What is your life echoing through eternity? Welcome to Echoes Through Eternity with Dr. Jeffrey Skinner. Our mission is to inspire, engage, and encourage leaders from across the globe to plant missional churches and be servant leaders. So join us and hear the stories of servant leaders reverberating lives as God echoes them through eternity. Brought to you by Missional Church Planting and Leadership Development in Dynamic Church Planting International. Welcome into Echoes Through Eternity. I am your host, Dr. Jeffrey D. Skinner. What is God echoing through your life today? I am joined in the studio today by Columbus Cody. He is head of, he's not head of school. He is a teacher at head school, head magnet school in Nashville, Tennessee. I ran across his profile on LinkedIn. He and I began to talk. And I knew almost immediately after I began to listen to some of his his speaking engagements and read some of his content, this was a guy who God was using in powerful ways in the marketplace, in the workplace, a teacher in public school, and 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 just sharing the word of God, not overtly, not not holding you know sermons, doing sermons in the middle of class, but just simply living his life. And then outside of class, writing books, he has a book called Recap that he's written. He's a speaker. He's chief encourager. He just, he's telling me this morning, he, his son's 13 years old and he's taking him out for driving lessons just to have some, some father-son time there. And those are the types of people we like to have on at Cuts Through Eternity is the people that may not be in the church and, and are just serving God in anonymity oftentimes, but are, are being faithful. And in doing so, God is using them in powerful ways. And, and I think that's something that today in this culture we need to learn is that ministry doesn't ha- just happen inside the church walls. Ministry is happening as we live our life. And that's the theme of this season of Echoes Through Eternity is how God is equipping people and using them in all walks of life. So, Cody, welcome in, brother. It's good to have you here today. Oh, thank you so much. I'm honored to be a guest on your show. Yeah. So so tell us a little bit. Now you've how did you get into kind of tell us about your story, your journey, how you got to heard you say you grew up in Louisiana and mm-hmm. and uh, even had a brief football career and <laughs> very brief. Very <laughs> tell, brief. <laughs> tell us a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got there and journey of faith and then and then where you are today and what you do okay. to you know, spread the love of God. Awesome. All right. So I was born in Chicago. And when I was about two or three, my father and my mother, they divorced and we moved to Mississippi. And I lived in in the down in the Delta, Anguilla, Mississippi with my grandmother for a few years. And then we moved to Arizona. And I lived on a small Navajo reservation in Arizona called Chinle, Arizona. I lived there for a few years. We moved to New Mexico, which is just the state next door. Then we moved to Louisiana. All right. Now, I lived in Louisiana for six months, just half of my freshman year. And it was probably the roughest six months of my life. Like, it's like everybody wanted to fight. Like, it just made you, like, it was almost like it was a training ground to make sure you can handle hardship in life. I guess that's how I could think of it. Because it was right outside of New Orleans. It was Metairie, Louisiana. Then we moved back to New Mexico. And then we moved to Tennessee. So I, I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, my junior year, second semester of my junior year in high school. I graduated here in uh, Nashville. And then I went, I joined the U.S. Navy after graduation, served three years in the Navy, came home and started my college career. And I attended Tennessee State University. And I was majoring in physical therapy at first because I wanted to be in the sports field and I want to be an athletic trainer. So I worked in the athletic training training room for one semester and realized I do not want to do this. They work from sun up to sundown 
and they really don't get paid much you know unless you're the head trainer of a big university or something like that you're not getting paid a lot and so the the beauty though and and i thank god for this i was i was talking to the head trainer one day he said you know you don't have to major in physical therapy to be a trainer you can change your degree to physical education and it might be a little easier and so i changed my major to physical education and to this day i'm so grateful that he told me that you know and then as i'm i started refereeing basketball i was like you know i kind of like basketball i love basketball i think i'm making coach this game you know so i asked my head at referee i was like the leading referee the one who trained all of us if you were to send me to someone who would mentor me on how to be a basketball coach, who would you say? And without blinking, he gave me a name. And so I called that gentleman who's in the Hall of Fame at Tennessee, in the state of Tennessee as a basketball coach. He tells me to come over that evening to their basketball and they have a game that night. And he interviews me in his office and he just says, won't you stick around tonight and stay for the game? And I was on the bench as a volunteer assistant for the next two years. And then I finished college and I started, you know, student teaching and I became the freshman girls coach at Glencliff High School. Now I'm teaching elementary PE, best job on the planet, right? There's no job better than elementary PE. All the kids love you. You know, you've got the ideal job. And I realized I want to be a head coach, head varsity coach. And in order to do that, you have to be in the building. You got to teach in the high school. <clears throat> so... When the position opened for me to teach at the high school that I've been coaching at freshman for so long, I took that job. And then I became the head girls basketball coach at Glencliff High School. And my first son was born. And as soon as he was born and I held him in my arms, I knew I was going to have to quit coaching. <laughs> and I, I mean, I just said, I, there's no way I can give my family 100% and give my girls 100%. And I hate losing. So I have to give 100%. And so I told my wife, I was like, I'm going to resign coaching. And she she didn't believe it. You know, she said, until the moment you actually made it official, I thought you would back out. Because she said, I know how much you love basketball. And I said, sweetie, no, no, I like basketball a lot. I love my family. There's a difference. And so I, I resigned coaching and I've been, you know, da on daddy duty ever since. And it was a blessing because not long after I resigned, my mother-in-law, who would keep my son, she had a stroke. And when she had her stroke, it totally changed the way we live as well. You know, like two to three nights a week, my wife doesn't even stay in our home. She sleeps at my mother-in-law's house. And so she rotates with her siblings who gives the evening care. And me not having to be pulled away from the sport out of necessity later, it was my choice from the beginning, I think caused there to never be resentment or anything like that. And, you know, and I, I, it's hard to even think that someone having a stroke would be a blessing. <clears throat> but me having to take care of my sons in a different way than most fathers do, because like I said, two to three nights a week, daddy had to give the boys a bath. Daddy had to read the bedtime story. It probably made our bond that much stronger, you know. So I think it, it forced me to step up as a dad as well to be a better dad. Like I knew I want to be a great dad, but... I, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think I'm a pretty decent dad. My wife would probably say, you know, better than decent. Hopefully my, my boys will grow up and they will say, man, my dad was awesome. You know, now my greatest desire in this world is for my sons to grow up and know God from an early age. I've told them that not church membership, not church attendance, but to actually know God. And so, as you mentioned earlier in the bio, I, I strive to be that living example, especially for my sons. You know, if I can't lead any other kid to Christ, I need to at least lead my own to, you know? And so I try to shine my light and be that positive example for them. And so, you know, I haven't coached in what, 13 years. Everybody asks me, are you going to get back into it? I'm like, I'll be honest with you. I love my family time so much. I don't, my identity wasn't as a coach. You know, I know a lot of people who that's their identity. I'm Coach Cody, you know, and everybody calls me Coach Cody still, you know, because I, I'm a PE teacher. Like, hey, Coach Cody. And so I don't, but that's not my identity. I didn't, I don't get my value from telling somebody else's kids what to do on a basketball court, you know? And 
So, you know, I, I hadn't been teaching. I mean, I hadn't been coaching forever, just been teaching. And I was, as we were talking about earlier before the interview started, I was so close to quitting teaching because I was burned out too. Not because of the teaching, it's all the other stuff. You know, all the other stuff that's not teaching. You know, most people don't recognize that when you're a teacher, you're not just a teacher. You're a you're a social worker. You're a counselor. You're a you're like you're pulled in so many directions. You're exhausted. And so I'm like, Lord, I can't I can't do this anymore. And you mentioned my book recap. That was the first book I wrote. The first book I wrote recap was written. And it was it, again, it just shows you how good God is. I was teaching a Wednesday night Bible study and I taught a lesson that I titled Recap of the Word. And so I went from the beginning and it started with rebellion. Adam and Eve rebelled against God. So the first thing was rebellion. So I took them through principles that you find in the Bible. So because of the rebellion, they needed redemption. In order to have redemption, there must be repentance. So everything was re, 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 re. So I titled it a recap of the Bible. So I'm driving to work one day and I hear this audible voice in my head that said, you need to turn that Bible study lesson into a book to let other people have access to it. And so I kind of dismiss it because I'm like, that definitely ain't God talking to me because I don't even read. So you know I, mean? <laughs> I mean, the only reading I do is my Bible. You know, I don't I don't read for enjoyment. I read for enlightenment. Right. Right. So I'm like, oh, yeah, that can't be God. So a few days goes by and I hear it again. So clear. It's like loud in my ear. You've got to turn that Bible study lesson into a book. And I'm like, OK, Lord, if that's you speaking to me, I will do this. But you have to help me. I don't know anything about writing a book. I don't know anything about publishing. And lo and behold, you know, a year later or whatever, Recap was was published, right? And it, it's crazy because I would write a little and take off two months and then write a little. And I could have literally written this in a month had I had to just sit down and write. And there would be nights where God would wake me up at like two in the morning and I could not sleep. And it was like, I'm going to go down the stairs and write in the book a little bit. So I go downstairs and I write. And I promise you, every time I did that, I was like, oh, my God, I don't know what this is going to sound like in the morning because I'm tired. This probably is not going to make any sense. It was always the best parts of the chapters, right? So I'm like, Lord, this is beautiful. And, and I hadn't even kept up with the sales on it, you know, because that wasn't my motive. It, but every time I get an email from someone who's read the book and told me how much you know, the chap which chapter blessed him the most. And it's like, that was like the greatest fulfillment of knowing that one, I honored God's request of me and two, it has encouraged someone else. Right. So fast forward. Now I'm writing a book for teachers, right? I wrote a book called the tired teacher, eight tips, eight tips to beat burnout. Right. <laughs> and that book I can't tell you how many teachers have emailed me concerning that one to let me know, man, you hit it on the head and because it's a very quick and easy read. It's fun and it's encouraging because there's a lot of good teachers that are hanging it up. And that's that was my my motives was to encourage the good teachers to say huh, these kids actually do need you. I know that your mental health is like on the brink. I know that you've been pulled and and you feel like you have literally nothing left to go but you're doing greater than you think you are, right? Your, your, your light is the reason why several of your students come to school. So you gotta keep shining, even though the, there's a weight to this, there's a heaviness to this, but no matter where we go, you're gonna have to deal with some weight somewhere, you know? So I wrote that book, and then I wrote a book called Too Many Toys in the Tub. It's a children's book. So when my sons were small, I came upstairs and I was getting ready to give him a bath. And my son, I think he literally had every toy in the house in the tub. And I said, <laughs> son, that's too many toys in this tub. And as soon as I said it, it was like the Holy Spirit said, that's your next book. So I wrote a little cute children's book called Too Many Toys in the Tub. And and that's that's been one of my favorites, you know, just just because it's 
it's such it just even like now I'm smiling saying it because I could still it takes me back to that day. And every parent I've talked to has had that experience. We're like, oh, my yeah, goodness. yeah. I mean, when you, when you said the title, I was like, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 And and when my oldest was about, I want to say maybe two or three, he was in daycare and he got in trouble for hitting. He was hitting other kids. And so I was at school when I was teaching high school still. And I wrote a book called Hands Aren't Made for Hitting. And I asked one of my high school students to illustrate it for me. So I bought these little blank books and they drew pictures from me so I could read it to my son at night. Right. That instead of me spanking you to tell you that you can't use your hands to hit people and I'm here using my hands to hit you. <laughs> I had to figure out a way to teach it in a to, to positively reinforce what I was trying yeah. to show him. So I'm reading him this book every night. Hands aren't made for hitting. Hands are made for eating. Hands are made for high-fiving. Hands are, you know, all these things. And again, I was just like, you know what? I have this book that's been hand-illustrated by my former students. I could take my same idea and now make it a little bit more professional for, you know, everyone else whose children are going through the same cycles like my son did. And so I... I I published that one as well. So now I have four books that are published and and God has placed, I think I got about four ideas in my spirit now that I've started two of them and I'm like, Lord, I just, I need you because I feel overwhelmed. I, there's so much I want to do for you, but I'm like, I can't get my mind and my body to sit down and write, you know? I take this one. I've, I, like I said, I've written one. I'm in the process of writing a second one. It's, it's, I'm still working on the title. I think it's called Mentor Me, Shaping the Christian Identity of the Next Generation. I think it's what the title I'm working with. At least that's what I told the publisher I was going to mm -hmm. call it. Um, the uh, But as I, I also hired a writing coach to kind of work with me a little bit just because I'm a perfectionist and, and I just like to make sure that what I'm putting out there is good quality content. But and she keeps take, say, trying to encourage me to change the title a little bit. So we'll see. But but I, I know what you're talking about. Just, you know, having the discipline to sit down and write. And, yeah, it's tough. And then yeah. when you do sit down and write, you have in your head what you want to communicate. But what comes out on the paper is not always it. So then you're rewriting and, and <laughs> typing. And, and sometimes I'll write it out. Like I'll just be sitting waiting at a softball game. And I'll write some in my, on my phone. You know, and then I come back to the laptop and sit and work on the laptop there. So, so I, I if you've written four, brother, I'm <clears throat> congratulations. I'm just on my second, and the second one should be easy for me because it was the topic of my dissertation, which was shaped, which was you know what creates a Christian identity in in adults. You know what, and so I looked at three different things, and I was telling you earlier I couldn't remember the third one. Two of them was experience and relationships. And experiences were a small part of it, but overwhelmingly relationships were the primary point of impact. If you want an adult to have a meaningful Christian identity, if they've got a mentor, and I don't mean a pastor, and, it, you know, Christian homes, you know, that environment was the other. So if they grew up in a Christian home, that was good, but it doesn't guarantee that you know, they're going to become a Christian. I right. say it this way. I can live in a garage. I'm not mm -hmm. going to grow up to be a car. So, uh, you know, growing up in that environment didn't guarantee a Christian identity because it just, it's just, they, for some reason they take, I'm a pastor. My kids take it for granted, but when they have other people, I've always been intentional about having other people pour into them mm -hmm. the Christian faith in addition to us. And we reinforce even what the others say, and they reinforce what we say. It's such an important thing there. And I, I think it's so awesome what you're doing there and in, in pouring into your children, but also pouring, you know, taking the, the experiences of your life and mm -hmm. putting those into a book form and tired teachers. Show me a teacher. My wife is a teacher. Show me a teacher who's not tired and I will show <laughs> you a teacher who is not a teacher. <laughs> right, right. That, that, those two words are synonymous, right? That's right. Tired <laughs> teachers. Have, and especially you and I were talking before after COVID, you know, they're just, you know, as they, you guys had to add uh, nurse, you know, mm -hmm. medical and, you know, social worker, 
you know, you're seeing into some of these kids' homes and, and when they're doing these Zoom classrooms and, yeah. you know, and you're seeing, okay, now I think I understand why they struggle in school. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, you'd yeah. be surprised when I was teaching online, you would hear the parents have their, their music up really loud in the background yeah. or the, their TV's on. Like, Sky, like, and I'm like, you know, obviously you might be in a position where you can't go to another room. Maybe, you know, you don't know the child's situation. But as a parent, for these few hours, I'm going to give my baby that time of, of uninterruption so that they not, but not everybody thinks that way. And it's like, you know, is there, I used to tell my students, see if you can find you, even if it's the closet, you know, go to the closet and sit in there. And that way you can have no interruptions, you know. Um, because for us, I, again, because I'm PE, when we met as a class, they we had a rule where we couldn't grade them on like the class participation because anything could happen, right? Technology was technology. They could lose their signal, couldn't get in there. So then now they're taking an F because they're not in the class. So all of your grades would come from the work they submit. So what I did for my class, when we joined the class, we would always do physical activity together. I would either lead you know, an exercise through they could see my screen and we're exercising together. Or I would do like a yoga video and they follow that or a quick, you know, low impact cardio that they could do in their room, right? No equipment, none of that. But their assignment, I would explain the assignment to them and then we do our exercise. And that way, if a student wasn't there, we had to record it. They could go back and watch and go, okay, that's how I do the actual written assignment. Right. And that's how I structured my class. Well, like I said, I'm sitting here talking to a kid and their mic comes unmuted and you can hear the loud movie in the background. And it's not them watching a movie. It's their parent behind them. I'm thinking, mom, come on, position your baby to be successful. You know, and at first it was like, wow, these teachers are heroes that I didn't realize what they had to do till I'm stuck with my own kid for three, six months. And then they were like, COVID, man, they'll be all right. They need to let yeah. the kids go back to school. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, so we went from being heroes to being the goat in six months. Cause now I'm tired <laughs> of being, I'm tired of being in this house with my kids. Y'all, y'all, and I yeah. tell people all the time, I worked harder online yeah. than I did in person. So a lot of people thought well, they're lazy, they don't want to go back to work. No, 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 no. I'd rather be back at work, but I want to be back at work when I'm safe. I don't want right. to be back at work and I'm it's hard for me to do my job because I'm terrified of your son sniffling today. You know, I don't, <laughs> don't want to mistreat your baby, but I need him to be on that side of the gym. You know I, mean? like, I don't want him sneezing on me, you know, but you know, just even when we came back because we still had to wear the mask, I had to totally change. How I did my class. So even our activities were so low impact because it's hard to breathe behind that mask. So I think teachers are probably some of the most resilient people on the planet. Very creative, very flexible. You got teachers who, especially, just say a very seasoned teacher. She's, she or he's been teaching 25, 30 years. Most of those teachers do not like technology. It, they're fearful of it, right? And so now you're having to learn how to do a video conference and you're, you're a 65-year-old teacher. Like, I don't know. How to, um, now you're panicking and freaking out. And now this teacher is fluent with it, right? She's an expert or he's an expert. And it's because, again, the the never say quit mentality that teachers have, you know? And I think if people really understood that, they would do everything to help their child's teacher. Everything. Yeah. Well, my wife and I have, have the discussion often because, you know, you as a teacher, I don't know what it is, but it seems like teachers are everybody's favorite punching bag. <laughs> uh, education scores in, in the United States are the worst ever. You know, reading our kids don't know how to read. They don't know how to write, you know, and, and it's just all y'all's fault. Every time, every time a, a child <laughs> fails a test, it's, it's your fault. You know, it's a child gets a stump toe at school. It's your fault. It <laughs> doesn't right. matter yeah. what it is. And, and so we, we have this discussion, you know, because the average person out there didn't recognize, okay, we're, we're training. My wife works at a school where English, 95% of the student population, English is her second language. And so then she comes, she teaches science 
she's trying to teach teaches life science so she's trying to teach you know basic human life principles to people that don't even speak english and then they take the test that's written in english and then they fail that test well if if I don't care how smart I am. If I go to Mexico and take a test or somebody hands me a test here in America written in Spanish, I'm probably going to fail it. <laughs> so, you know, we're educating everybody, regardless of who they are. Regard, We don't check their legal status. We don't check their passports. We don't check, you know, where they come from. We don't check their family environment. We don't even check if it's their real mom and dad when they walk in a door dropped off at school or when they catch that bus. You know, that's not the teacher's responsibility. The teacher's responsibility is supposed to be to teach. But as you said, they have to do so much more than teach. Hey, our test scores might go up if the children had a home environment where they could study. Our test scores might go up if the children weren't having to deal with whatever they're dealing with at home sometimes. And so I think I think contextualizing that is important uh, because we're educating everybody, whereas you know China and Japan and and some of these others that are way at the top up there that we get compared to. If if at 12, 13 years old you have not shown an academic efficiency or proficiency, you get a job. Right. You're you're right. working at 12 or 13. Yeah. And so if you want any type of future. You're, you're as a child, you know, the day you're born, the, the motivation is high. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> right. The motivation, right. the stakes funny, are high. The motivation. That's is high. exactly right. Funny story. My son, I told you he started college last year and I don't mean to air dirty laundry, but he didn't do the best in the world that he could do his first year of college. And so I told him when he went back this year, I said, no, son, I said, we paid that first year of college. But because the the class that you failed, you got to pay for those. So you know this is this is on you. And I said, you know, he says he wants to be an entrepreneur. I said that's great, but entrepreneur, you got to have a skill. You know, you don't just show up and say I'm gonna own my own business one day. That's all entrepreneur means. You own your own business. It's not a profession. And so you gotta, you know, if you're gonna be oh, start your own sports coaching thing, then you're you be a that's the entrepreneur. You have a skill as a coach to do that, and in, in that particular sport, you know, if you're going to do a uh, be an entrepreneur, to own your own mechanic shop, well, you got to be proficient in fixing cars. And so you got to have a skill there. What's your skill? And he's just not ever other than sports. He's never really shown a big, huge interest in any specific thing. I said, so you got to be in college to get an experience, to get some some breadth of knowledge there, to find out what your interest will be. So if you don't do well this year, I don't know what you're going to do because you're not going to live in my basement. Number one, I don't have a basement. So you can't live in something that or doesn't exist. Attic, you know? right. Or my <laughs> attic, right? <laughs> and so he's doing really well this year. And so I, I sent him a, a message the other day and I said, buddy, I'm really proud of you. I said, you're working hard this year. And I said, I haven't seen you out late or anything. I told him, I said, the key for you is getting rest. You can't get, you know, stay up to three o'clock in the morning, wake up for class at 7 a.m. and expect to comprehend what the teacher's teaching you there. Right, you know? right. And just, you know, everybody goes through it their freshman year. I went through it. And, and uh, so, but I just told him I was proud of him. And he replied back, I don't want to be poor. <laughs> <laughs> great motivation and i said hey that, that's good yeah you know, whatever uh -huh. it takes for you to get those a's and b's up there right. you latch on to that truth brother <laughs> and you you hold on to it to the end uh -huh. so there's something about poverty there's something about knowing you know back to what we were talking about educating the masses there's something about knowing that that, that gives you some motivation you know yeah, and absolutely. sometimes i think it's the kids that come from some of the harshest environments that perform the best. And some of these kids that come from a, you know, well-managed middle-class home, sometimes they're the ones that, that's getting into most trouble because they, they, they sometimes have this attitude. No, this is, I'm not talking all of them. This is some, they have this entitlement attitude. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm entitled here. And I don't know how we do that, how we can instill in our kids that education is a privilege, not an entitlement. We have turned it into an entitlement in the United States. 
And that's, you know, so I think that's um, kind of what happens in Christian homes. We turn God into an entitlement. Somehow or another, we're entitled to this grace and mercy and salvation that we have. And, and you know, we didn't earn it, but we certainly need to appreciate the gift. Yeah. But so, um, how do they how do they buy your books? They buy them on Amazon or uh... yeah. Well, you can go to my website www.columbuscody.com. Okay. www.columbus like Christopher Columbus. Yeah. Cody C O D Y. dot com. And you know, all my books are on there as well. I also created what I call witness wear. You know, it's clothing that sparks a conversation. So I have t shirts and hoodies that you can buy that are Christian. Um, Christian statements or Christian, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the themes are Christian themes. And that way, you know, when a person sees your t-shirt, they're like, hey, what does that mean? It's like, oh, thank you for opening that door. It's time for me to witness to you, you know? And it's a general way of witnessing because I think a lot of people are terrified of speaking uh, just about Jesus to random people, which is funny because we'll talk about the football game to a random person. We'll talk about, you know, the thing that you have a passion for is what you're going to talk about. And, and I think a lot of people want to be better at witnessing and want to be more, let their light shine more. They just feel intimidated. And I always say it like this. My thing is this. Don't share what you do know. Don't feel bad about what you don't know. But let what you don't know motivate you to want to know more. Right. So instead of being satisfied on the surface with your relationship with God, want to go deeper because i promise you the bible tells us no good thing will he withhold from us if you're chasing after him with your whole heart he's going to expose a lot to you and then our motives is not to know more so i can argue more or put more people in their place my goal is to know more so i'm more equipped to debunk all the barriers the enemy is going to put in the way from i'm trying to share this gospel with you but you have a preconceived notion of who god is and so you keep fighting me, fighting me, fighting me. Whereas because I filled my heart with the spirit of God and filled my heart with, well, with the word of God. And then the spirit of God says, okay, well, share that verse that you read seven months ago and didn't know why you were putting that in. Now you share that verse and that person's like, oh, I see what you're saying. I get it. And, you know, my wife sent me a video the other day, a TikTok video, and I saved it. And it was with the idea of, it was, well, it was a lady who she was talking to this Satanist. He was a Satanist. And he said he he kept on going on. She never said a word. He kept on talking about, you know, his, you know, how he became a Satanist and all this stuff and all this. And when she got up, she just embraced him and hugged him. Thank you for sharing your journey with me. Something like of that nature, she said. And he said when she embraced him, he felt something. He didn't know what it was. He felt this like overwhelming warmth. And so he was like, what in the world was that? And then he, I don't know how it triggered in him, but he found that that was Jesus embracing him. And so he became a Christian, right? And and I told my wife, I said, I'm gonna tell you the beauty of that video is this. Most of us, the moment we meet a person that says they're a Satanist, we wanna set them straight so bad. We want to hit them with the right left combo of the word of God. And all she did was she listened. She showed him love in spite of what he thought he was. And the enemy now, who better, who better to speak God's word than someone who used to be, right? The the as Paul would say, I'm chief, I was the chief sinner, right? I mean, who better to to encourage the masses to come out of the darkness than one who used to well in the darkness and will openly admit it most of us don't want to tell everybody the darkness we used to be in like well i was never in that much darkness you know and like you mentioned earlier about the entitlement of being a follower of christ we just feel like you know god owes us something and god is like oh, i think you owe me everything yeah <laughs> that wow that is such uh so, so well said cody that's such an important point there that we don't have to be theologians. We don't have a have to have a doctorate in theology or in philosophy in order to engage in conversation with someone. I, sometimes, a lot of times, truthfully, our, I've, I've never known. I've never argued anyone into the kingdom of God. Let me put it that way. <laughs> You're right. You know, I, I can stand there and and yell at somebody and and tell them and and just completely dismantle 
their argument mm -hmm. from a from an a, an intellectual point of view, from an academic point of view. There, that doesn't convince them. It's not knowing when the Bible talks about knowing God. It's not brain he's talking mm -hmm. about. It's heart. Yeah. It's in fact. Um, for the, for the for the Hebrew, the soul we think about it at heart really is the gut was the center of thought. Even for the Greek, you know, the gut and the, and the Near East and the Christianity is a, a kind of a Near East religion. We forget that They're born out of the Middle East, not the not the United States. But mm -hmm. that's a different topic for a different time. <laughs> but the, so is when we talk about this feeling. Is it's I mean it comes from that gut there, and I found it interesting that the more well, I'm hearing a lot of conversations these days about brain and gut connection as yeah. far as health goes, right? And so you know I think the the more we we learn intellectually, the more we end up finding that spiritually, what the Bible says is, and the way they understood it sometimes before they had all this education. <laughs> <laughs> they understand good uh, good instincts there, mm -hmm. so that's so important that well we just love people you know just kind of live authentically and and that's true that's what I found in my um research for my doctor my dissertation yes. was that you didn't have to have a Bible study if you're mentoring someone into the kingdom it's not about a Bible study is uh, those may happen I mean I remember as a pastor a lot of times I would I'd go to breakfast at Chick Fil A and. And there'd be a couple of college students there, and there'd be one college student, you know, discipling another college student there. And I, I love that. They were going through the Bible, and I think it's important. But the thing that had the most meaningful impact on on the what my state showed, the thing that had the most meaningful impact was that relationship that they had, mm -hmm. not the knowledge, head knowledge that they poured into someone. And so such a when I was pastoring, we had a young lady in the church who was a witch. She claimed her, she claimed to be a witch. And uh, to start with, uh, she'd been very abused, grew up in the foster care system. And so she was, you know, just very guarded to begin with. Mm -hmm. And I met her at, I used to do my sermons at Dunkin' Donuts. So I met her in Dunkin' Donuts and, and we just began to have a conversation and I didn't approach things from an intellectual point of view. I just just met them where they were, you know, and listened to them, like you said. And then she wanted to come to church, so we'd pick her up and bring her to church. And so after about a year of coming to the church, she wouldn't know. She said, "Pastor Jeff, can I get up and give a testimony?" And I said, "Well, yeah, sure. What you what you because she had not, to my knowledge, accepted Christ or anything mm -hmm. like that." And, I wouldn't be sure what she's going to say. <laughs> right, right. But you handed that advice. <laughs> she huh? got, got up. <laughs> and so she, I said, yeah. And so she told me, she, I just want to talk about, you know, the, the appreciate the church and all. And I said, okay. So I said, well, we got to, I said, before I do my sermon this morning, I, just, I said, you know, called her name. as something she wants to say. And she got up and she said, I just want everybody to know that I'm a witch. And I said, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and she said, but I love Jesus. And uh, she said, and you guys are the ones that taught me to love Jesus. Mm. And she said, I still call myself a witch. I won't call myself a Christian, but I'm not quite there. But I do love Jesus. Mm. And she said, I hope that was okay, Pastor Jeff. And I said, that's absolutely fine. And I said, Jesus loves you too, exactly how you are. And he's waiting for you when you can finally claim him mm. as your central identity instead of a witch as your central identity. Mm -hmm. For her, it was, and I understood this, you know, psychologically, and that's the only thing, the only connection she had to her mom. She had been in foster care. Her mom had claimed to be a witch. And so, you know, it was not something that she could really hang on to there. And so witch was, was the only vestige of her personal connection identity that she had so you know when she but i remember the day that she finally let go and she said you know what jesus is my dad you know god is my father i i can if i've got that then whatever else has happened in my life and 
So anyway, just yeah. and it came from love. You know, I didn't yeah, argue her absolutely. into the kingdom. I didn't give her three right. points of salvation. She didn't you know, <laughs> say, here, you got to say a sinner's prayer. Mm-hmm. It was just a matter of it. And, and I wasn't a hero of that story. I mean, it wasn't me. It was God right. through me. It was the right. congregation that loved on her. I had an associate at the time who was training in training to, to be a pastor. And she just had this incredible way of connecting on a deep level with other uh, people that were in deep, deep, deep pain and suffering and sin. And, you know, just offered them grace and mercy beyond anything that they can. And she she really was the primary person that had a relationship with that with that um, lady. I kind of brought them in and and I'd let her love on them a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I loved them, but, but, you know, it's difficult as a guy, you know, when it's a female, you have to be very careful in how you're right. interacting and things like right. that. But, 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 but like um, you said, just the fact that you had an associate that understood that the role that they played was, you know, valuable, so valuable. And now who knows that this, this lady that first identified as a witch will become like the next female, the greatest evangelist for the Lord ever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, she's the female Billy Graham. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's like, and it's because you chose to love her in spite of what you, she spoke with her mouth. Right. You know, because you think, you think that's who you are until yeah. God shows you him, himself for real. And when you see God for real, you see who you really are for real. Yeah. You know, and you see yourself as a broken vessel that he sees still as valuable. Yeah. And and it's like I, I will take the scraps of your life and turn you into something that it will be called a masterpiece if yeah. you will allow me. You know. That's so good. Cody, it's it's great having you, brother. I could go on all day with you. We just we're just we got this connection here. We love love the Lord and I love your philosophy of life and how you connect with people and so you're a speaker as well, and I'm assuming they can book you to speak on your website. As they well? can, yeah. So the, again, www.columbuscody.com, and there's a contact form on there. Um, and my contact form serves several different purposes. If there's a prayer request. There's a link there. To click for prayer request. If they do, would they if they would like to book me as a speaker for their engagement or their conference or whatever, that that is also in there. They click the booking, and then it'll ask them a few questions. And then I'll be able to get in touch with them to, to fine tune all the details of the, the event and to make sure that I'm available. And then, you know, I, again, my my thing is this. I always want to let God use me to encourage the heart of someone else. Right. You know, and the, the thing that I love the most is that I grew up in church like a lot of people do. But I didn't like church. Right. Yeah. And it's because there was nothing for kids, per se. Yeah. There was nothing for us. And so, I mean, as as we talked about earlier, a lot of times a child will veer away, but because the foundation has been set, Proverbs is telling us the truth. Train up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, they won't depart. We're going to come back, you know, but we got to, the training's got to be there though. You know what I mean? You can't expect them to come back if there's nothing, no foundation has been laid. So, and I, I'm Nazarene as well. I didn't tell you that as well, but I, I go to Christ Church of the Nazarene in Nashville, Tennessee. And when I the first moment I walked into Christ Church, the first moment I came home from the Navy, my mom invited me to go to church with her. And I'm like, I don't want to go to church. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I go to church and the spirit, the love in that building is there. There goes right back to your dissertation relationship. Right. The love in that building was like I knew from that moment I'm where I'm supposed to be. Right. And so God has continued to to use my pastor to mentor me, to show me things and to put me in positions where I have to serve in a way that I would have never. How you go from being a kid that doesn't like church to one who can't wait to teach Sunday school to when your pastor asks you to speak in morning worship, you're like, oh my gosh, yes, I will definitely do that. You know, you don't even have to give me much of a notice. Just tell me Sunday morning, I'm ready. You know what I mean? It's like you that the, the love is there and it's because you see what God has done in your life and you know, it has nothing to do with how good you were. You know, like I said, I was in the Navy. So the term cousin like a sailor, that's true. You know, <laughs> I came home one day and I was talking to my mom at her kitchen table and she she had this look on her face that was like, I'm like, why are you looking like that, mom? She said, do you hear the words that are coming out of your mouth? I'm like, what do you mean? Every other word I used was a profanity. 
And I didn't even recognize I was talking that way. And I'm like, you know what? When she said that, I said, you know what? I'm not going to talk like this anymore, you know? And so I started monitoring the words that I speak. And I tell my students that, like you said, I, I don't say, hey, Jesus said, I will say, what if we valued every word we spoke? You know, and they're like, well, you know, because a lot of students, again, to them in my family, if you're not loud, you get overlooked. In my family, it, you know, we, I mean, that's just how everybody talks. I said, no, nah, everyone doesn't talk like that. I don't use profanity. Please don't use it in my classroom. You know, and then the kid, I had a kid years ago. He was like, hey, y'all stop cussing. You know, he's a Christian. Now, I've never <laughs> said anything about being a Christian, but he understood. And he could see my spirit. Right. And that same kid asked me a question. I'll never forget it. This was, he was a sophomore in high school. He said, coach, what if you die? and find out that God is not real, right? The whole class was quiet. Now, he asked me that question. I didn't open up no Bible in my class, but if you open that door, I walk it in, yeah, right? There you go. I said, I said, now that is an outstanding question. I said, but what if I live my life the way I want to and I don't do things the way God is told and I find out that he is real? Yeah. And he was like, I can accept that because the thing is, what have you really lost yeah. if you live according to the way God has told you? Maybe you don't go to all these places that the world tells you is so fun, yeah. but I have a lot of fun in my life without going to those places, right? I, I mean, and, and and I do live the way I tell people on Sunday to live. That's who I am when I'm not at church. You know, I'm the same person. You know, I'm silly. I'm goofy. I love Jesus and I love people, you know, and and I joke around a lot, but that's authentically me. I'm not trying to be 007. I'm fake, fake person here and then somebody real here. You know, I'm who I am everywhere I go. And because it makes life so much more simple when you don't have to be a different person around different people, you know. And but when he walked, when he said that, I was like, man, that is thank you for asking me that question, you know. And so, you know, I just think about how. Like you said, when it comes to speaking, my, my my biggest goal is to help people also grow closer to God. And so every opportunity I get a chance to speak, I jump on those opportunities because I want to I want people to walk away and go, I want to be close to God so bad. You know, right. I think it was Joyce Meyer. I think I was listening to her book years ago and she said we are as close to God as we want to be. Yeah. And that has stuck with me. We are as close to God as we want to be. There's nothing stopping this except us, you know, yeah. you know, and, and I just thought that was beautiful. It is. Remind me, what's your pastor's name up there? Rollin Coleman. Rollin oh, D. Coleman. Coleman. I couldn't, I, I know several of them up there, and but I couldn't remember if he was one. I don't know him, but there's several. I also train pastors to plant churches and, and church planting and even lead pastors. I will they'll come in and take the training dynamic church planning international a company I volunteer with. And so we do the training online videos and then we'll, we'll have some one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with me or one of our other coaches. And anyway, we'll train existing pastors or pastors of established churches mm -hmm. because the most effective form of evangelism is church planting. There's mm -hmm. something about an established church after 10 or 12 years um, they just get more internally focused. It's just, it's, it's almost like a family and nothing wrong with the family, except that families tend to be closed. I don't right. walk out on the street and invite new people into my family every day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come join my family today. Right, you know? right. It's a good way to go bankrupt real quick. Right. You look like you need a good family. Come on with me. <laughs> there you go. And you know, nothing wrong with inviting a guest in from time to time and caring for them, but you know, don't live with you. So, but that's what we're asking people to do at the church sometimes when we get that mentality is, hey, why don't you come be part of our family? So it becomes counterintuitive to them. So we tell the pastor, look, you know, if you if you launch a new church out of your church, so rather than trying to grow your church into this mega church, what if you were to take 20 of your strongest members, pray for God to send you or even raise up a church planter within your congregation, a Cody or somebody like that who has a passion for the gospel, your church sponsors them to 
be you know that new church and so you mentor him you you pour into that pastor church planting pastor or, and it could just be a church planter i mean it for years in church of nazarene lay people are the ones that plant the churches mm-hmm. and then and then the church would send and would call a pastor so and that's really you know if you really want a strong church have the laity plant a church now i don't mean get mad at the pastor and mm-hmm. say they're going to go right. somewhere I'm else split and, now. and start saying, yeah, yeah I'm going to split. Pastor wouldn't give me but one communion cup. I'm <laughs> out of here. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So anyway, that's that's the type of training we do because um, it is, it's just so effective. You know, it just mm-hmm. it really builds a kingdom. I mean, you look at the statistics and a new start church may have a uh, hundred salvations in a year and an established church may have 20. It's just the effectiveness of the evangelism as far as building the kingdom goes is such better, so much better and stronger as a church plant. So we'll we'll plant, we'll uh, train church established um, mm-hmm. pastors to plant churches. And I was just curious if your your pastor had been through it, but I don't recognize his name. Now, I'm sure he's familiar with it because Dwight Gunner, who is the uh, DS up in that area, is very passionate about church planting. You know, we've yeah. had a lot of church planters come through our training from up there, but. But I have to reach out to him and and get him involved because you sound like you'd be a good one to be planting some churches up there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, if but the anyway. Lord calls me to do it, I will be. Hey, there you go. That there you time. go. But yeah. you know, you're you're certainly planting seeds. You know, sowing seeds within your school. I'm not saying you got to be a professional clergy <laughs> to be effective. You're doing you're doing great work ministry where you are. But anyway, Cody, great having you, brother. Again, the uh, ColumbusCody.com is the website. He's a speaker. He's an author. He's a teacher, head, head encourager, chief encourager, you know, and father and husband. And so anyway, please check out the website. You can be a co-creator with God by helping to echo our voices. Share our episodes with friends and family and on your own social media accounts. Give us positive five-star reviews. Uh, The more positive reviews we have, the more visibility we have, and the more voices that are echoed through eternity. Uh, We often invite guests who are serving faithfully year after year, often in anonymity in their respective roles in ministries. God sees them, and and reality is, is for a good kingdom leader, that's enough. Uh, We do not do what we do for the accolades of humanity. We do it because we're called by God. Uh, But I believe that God uses people like you and I to continue those reverberations and echo them throughout eternity. You can partner with God by liking, subscribing, writing a quick positive five-star review, and again, sharing those voices with friends and family and on your own social media accounts. Those reviews will eventually lead to other guests who have larger platforms that have more listeners who will then in turn listen to the show and again it further echoes those voices which is the whole vision of the echoes through eternity podcast here is to continue echoing those voices that god is echoing um through eternity there